let's talk about 16.3 now, which is path independence and conservative vector fields. And this type of problem shows up a lot on exams. And to prove this fact, we're going to look at an exam from fall 2010. Uh, and this problem is number 17. And it's this following problem. Evaluate the integral uh, C of x squared dx plus y squared dy plus z squared dz, where C is the straight line segment from 1, 2, 3 to 2, 3, 4. So one way you can do this is you can actually just parameterize and integrate it. And I don't think it actually is that bad um, at all. So you can parameterize that straight line segment and then integrate it. And yeah, you know, you're good. Um, but because this is a 16, 3 problem, we're going to use the fact that there might be path independence. So what is path independence, right? Well, from uh, the problem, we can see that f is equal to x squared, comma, y squared, comma, z squared. And the idea is, if I have a function, all right, right, remember from 16.1, we had functions, right? If I had a function of x, y, z, which is equal to, you know, something x plus something y plus uh, something like z cubed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So if, if we have a function, it doesn't have to be that one. Um, the definition of path independence or a conservative vector field. Okay, so the definition of a conservative vector field is uh, if f, this vector, right? f is a vector, f is a vector, is equal to the gradient of little f for some function little f then f is con then big f is conservative all right and what does that mean if big f is conservative then the integral along the line of f dot dr is equal to little f at the end minus little f at the beginning. And so we'll see that in play here. So I'm going to claim that f is conservative, all right? Uh, big F is conservative. So that means I need to find some little f such that the gradient of that little f is equal to my vector field right here. And how do I do that? Well, it's the following, right? f, okay, so let's, t uh, f has three components, right? No, the big F has three components. Um, it has an x squared component, uh, a y squared component, and a z squared component, right? So this is really x squared. Um, uh, x squared is in the x component, right? So what I have then is I have the partial derivative of little f with respect to x is equal to x squared, right? I have the partial derivative of f with respect to y is equal to y squared. I have the partial derivative of f with respect to z is equal to z squared. And so what I need to do then is, okay, well, this is, uh, so what I want to do is I want to integrate both these, I want to integrate all three of these guys. And what should I integrate with respect to? So for example, if I look at this first equation right here, what do I have to integrate with respect to to get f itself? Well, because I took the partial with respect to x, I want to take the integral of both sides with respect to dx, right? And that makes sense because, uh, again, I took the partial with respect to x, so to get back to just the f itself, I got to integrate with respect to x. And so what is that? Well, the integral of x squared with respect to x is x cubed over 3. However, we're not done because what happens when you integrate? You always are left with constants, right? So now we got to add a constant, but we can have special constants because we integrated with respect to dx, right? We can have constants that are variables of y and z, right? Because just think about it. I took a partial derivative of f with respect to x, and I got just x squared. Now, if I had something else in my function, let's say f was equal to x cubed over 3 plus yz, what is df dx here? This is simply just x squared because the partial of yz with respect to x is equal to 0, right? So that means that in this constant function here, 
I can have functions of strictly y and strictly z's. So I can have like y times z, y cubed times z squared, uh, y squared, for example. So yeah, like I can have all of those guys. So I need to make sure that I keep note of that. And then likewise, we need to integrate these guys uh, with something. So this df dy, I should probably integrate the second term with respect to y, right? Okay, so that means I get y cubed over 3 plus some constant now of x and z. And then lastly, I want to integrate this last guy with respect to dz because I took a partial with respect to z. And now uh, this is equal to z cubed over 3 plus uh, cxy, some constant of xy. And what's the goal here? The goal is to get the right-hand side of these guys all equal to each other, right? because I only have a singular f, right? I only have one little f I can find. So I have to find the one little f such that when I take the partial with respect to x, I get x squared. If I take the partial with respect to y, I'll get y squared. And if I take the partial with respect to z, uh, I'll get z squared. So I need one function. So, technically, so when I integrated everything, so if I integrate this first guy with respect to x, the second guy with respect to y, this third guy with respect to z, I wanted to get the same equations on the left, right hand side. I wanted this first equation to be equal to the second equation. I want this to be equal to the third equation. I want the second equation to be equal to the third equation as well. But as you can see, the way it's written right now, uh, that's not the case, right? These three guys are nowhere close to being equal to each other. However, we have to remember the fact that I have constants of other variables right that are involved so for example if i look at this first equation i have constants of y and z right now i think to myself hey wait a moment uh y cubed over three is not in this equation right now but can it be in this equation can y cubed over three fit here somewhere and the answer is yes because y cubed over three is a constant right so I can actually have y cubed over 3 because y cubed over 3 is a constant with respect to x, right? So it's a constant with the function of y's and z's. So yeah, y cubed over 3 goes here. And now I look at z squared over or z cubed over 3. I integrated this incorrectly. And I think to myself, hey, z cubed over 3 isn't in this equation. Uh, can it be in this equation? And the answer is, yeah, z cubed over 3 can be in this equation as well because it can go into the constant as well. So now I have z cubed over 3, right? And, okay, now we do the same thing. I look at y cubed over 3, all right, y cubed over 3, that's cool. But I look at, oh, x cubed over 3 isn't in here, right? Uh, x cubed over 3 isn't in this uh, function. But hold on, x cubed over 3 can go into the constant term. So now I have x cubed over 3 because it can go into the constant term. And then z cubed over 3 can also go into the constant term. And look at that. These two equations are now the same. And using that exact same logic and reasoning, we can get x cubed over 3 plus y cubed over 3 into this bottom equation because they fit into that constant on there. And all of a sudden, all three equations are equal to each other, which means then I have found my little f, and my little f is equal to one third times x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed, right? And go ahead, take these partial derivatives. Take the gradient of little f. What do you get? You get x squared, y squared, z squared. Amazing, right? Because the gradient of little f is exactly equal to that guy up there. All right, so hopefully this, this method of finding little f makes sense. Essentially, uh, so a quick recap of what we did here. I took the x component uh, of the vector, right, which just happens to only have x's in it. But uh, again, I took the x component, all right? So I took everything, the i component. You can think of it, just everything in front of the i. So this would have been like x squared i plus y squared j plus z squared k, right? I took everything in front of the i and I integrated it with respect to dx. I take everything in front of the j, right, which is this guy, which is the second component, and I integrate it with respect to y, and take 
uh, everything in front of the K or the third component and I integrate it with respect to Z and then I after that you kind of play like a matching game where you see if stuff can get matched into uh, the constants and yeah we did that and then we got our little f so from here it's really easy because now we just need to evaluate little f at the end point minus little f at the beginning and what is that well little f at the end point right this is our end point this is our beginning point so now all we have to do is find f of 2 3 4 minus f of 1 2 3 right and what is that well this is one third times two cubed plus three cubed plus four cubed right minus one third times one cubed plus two cubed plus three cubed and what is that well this guy um, is uh, eight plus 27 plus 64 over three and this guy over here is one plus eight plus 27 over three and we see that oh okay um what happens well these guys cancel and so i'm left with 63 over 3 and the answer is going to be 21. and there you go you were able to evaluate uh this line integral without ever parametrizing anything without uh having to do any dot products right or even evaluating an integral there were no integral well, you had to evaluate these three integrals right here but besides that right really cool um and these types of problems actually uh, path independence will be uh, this type of uh, conservative vector field type of problems and path independence um, is very useful uh, when this inside part looks almost impossible uh, when your vector field looks almost impossible to uh, deal with and in this case it actually isn't that bad but um, that's one hint so there are two hints uh, to use uh, path independence for conservative vector fields uh, the first hint to use it is when to use the first hint is if f looks really bad big f right your vector field and the second hint is if the problem allows you to find the end points and beginning point uh, easily and in our case, this is comically easily because they just gave it to us, right? One, two, three, and two, three, four. So that's how I knew we needed to use path independence um, for this problem. And again, why is it called path independence? Uh, it's called path independence because notice how we calculated this answer. Uh, we found some function, uh, right? We found some little f that we plugged it into. Uh, notice that there's no path. There's no parameterization at all. So from one, two, three to two, three, four, it doesn't matter that it took a straight line, right? This, pro this part of the problem where it says that I took a straight line segment um, from 1, 2, 3 to 2, 3, 4, it doesn't matter because I never parametrized a curve. I just straight up took the end points, I took the beginning point, and I plugged them into a function. And so I could have taken any point I wanted, uh, any path I wanted to get to that point, and the answer would still be 21. Okay, And that's what's cool about conservative vector fields. Um, path independence just means I can take any path from point A to point B because I evaluate the, uh, the work done as uh, a function at the end point minus the function at the beginning point. And yeah, that's 16.3. So really, this is all I need to cover for 16.3. There are a lot of different problems um, that, on exams that deal with uh, path independence and conservative vector fields. So uh, get used to identifying when you can use this. And I'll cover a lot more examples in recitation and review sessions and so forth. So. Alrighty, we're moving on. Uh, section 16.4 is Green's theorem. Oh, last thing. Um, uh, path independence only works for uh, line integrals. Uh, so so it, it only works for line integrals, um, uh, also known as like flow integrals or a circulation uh, or a work, right? It doesn't work for flux integrals, all right? So don't try to use um, uh, path independence when you're asked to find the flux of something because that's just straight up wrong. So keep those in mind. 16.4, Green's theorem. There's only a few sections left and uh, in, in all of 114, and I'm excited. Uh, Green's theorem, also very important, and I'll see you guys in that video.